I'm standing near the ancient town of Bethlehem, where once the King of Kings was born. But long before Jesus, there was another king that was born here, and his name was David, who with nothing but a, a sling and a rock killed the mighty Philistine champion Goliath. This area and its surrounding regions proved to be a testing ground of faith in shaping the life of David. So come along with me as we learn more about the great life of David and our own personal walk of faith. David's story begins somewhere near Bethlehem in the heartland of the old tribal territory of Judah. Judah was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, and his descendants came to settle in this land just as God had promised some 400 years earlier. Judah's territory actually extended into four major geographical areas. Those areas are the Shvela, or the foothills on the west, the hill country in the center, the desert just west of the Dead Sea, and portions of the Negev, where the tribe of Simeon dwelt. Each of these four regions are unique in their own way, all of which helped to develop the faith of the young man who would one day become king over Israel. Here in the hill country, somewhere near Bethlehem, David grew up learning the ancient craft of shepherding as he watched over the flocks belonging to his family. Shepherding was hard work and it could also be frightening and lonely out away from the safety and security of a village or town. Shepherding was a solitary life. Shepherds spent a great deal of time watering their flocks and feeding them, and they had to watch for sheep that might wander away. But they also had to defend their flocks against thieves or wild animals. Shepherds had to put themselves in harm's way for the safety of their sheep. It's these kinds of experiences that prepare David to be a man of action. I could only imagine what David must have been thinking, especially at night as he watched over his sheep. Were there predators lurking in the night shadows? Were enemies of Israel passing through his father's fields? Was it in a place like this that David learned to trust in God and be inspired to write the most recited psalm in all of history? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. As a shepherd, David would not only have had the time to sing and develop lyrics for songs, but he would have also learned how to use the tools of his profession. Shepherds were equipped with several items. They had a staff they could use to guide the sheep. They had a rod or club that could be used as a weapon. They also carried a sling, which was an extremely accurate and deadly ranged weapon. David mentions that he fought a lion and a bear. He says that he took them by the beard. We might say in English that he grabbed them by the throat and he is victorious over them. David is used to trusting God and winning battles against opponents who are bigger and stronger. Both of them will serve him well when he battles the Philistines. David's earliest encounter with the Philistines happened in the Ela Valley just west of the Judean hill country. This valley is a part of the Judean Sphala, which is a Hebrew term meaning lowly or humble, and it was used to refer to the low rolling foothills of the larger mountains to the east. The Judean Shvela is comprised of five major valleys that run from east to west between the hill country on the east and the Philistine coast on the west. This region was the site for several well-known events in Israelite history involving heroes like Samson, Joshua, and Micah. The Shvela was important for several reasons. One, it acted as a buffer between Judah and the Philistines. Second, the broad U-shaped valleys were excellent for growing wheat and other crops. And third, 
These valleys served as the main route of travel to and from the hill country, giving the inhabitants of Judah access to the trade that ran up and down the coastal branch of the international north-south route. It was in this valley then that the Philistines had encamped, presumably to keep the Israelites at bay, but also hoping perhaps to gain control of the rich, fertile fields, not only of the Shvela, but also of the terraced farming lands in the Judean hill country. The Ela Valley was a primary route from the coastal plains eastward into the heart of Judah and the area of Bethlehem, David's home. The Philistines, if they had broken through those Israelite defenses, they would have been able to move about through Judah's hill country and have been only a short distance from Jerusalem. The Bible reveals to us that Goliath had positioned himself in the middle of the Elah Valley and was challenging God's people to send him a worthy challenger and bring this stalemate to an end. No one was ready to defend the armies of God against this mighty warrior until the young shepherd and armor bearer of Bethlehem arrived and entered the valley with nothing but a shepherd's staff and a bag and a sling. The actual confrontation could have taken place just about anywhere on this terrain, and this brook, though no one today knows for sure, could have been the actual spot where David selected his five smooth stones to carry into battle. From here, David would have been just a few steps away from his epic battle against Goliath. As David emerged from the creek bed, I can just imagine how all eyes must have been on him as he entered this coliseum of hills in a sort of gladiatorial style of setting. Over my shoulder to the left, the Israelites were encamped. Oh, how their hearts must have been pounding as they saw David coming out on this field. To David's right, Soko, where the Philistines were encamped all the way down the valley to Azekah. And then right in front of David, the mighty giant, with a helmet of brass and a coat of mail, and in his hand a spear, a large spear, and hearing Goliath say to David, Boy, I will feed your flesh to the birds and to the beasts of the field. Oh, how great faith David must have had as he faced that colossal of terror. David was up to the test, however, and confidently declared that just as God had delivered him from the paw of the bear and the mouth of the lion, that God would deliver him out of the hand of this uncircumcised Philistine. Indeed, with but one throw of his sling, David struck the champion warrior in the forehead, causing him to crash to the ground on his face in what must have seemed like a tree of Lebanon falling in the forest. David then took Goliath's sword and completed the task once and for all, ridding Israel of this terrifying menace. So as David squared off against Goliath, he was confident in God. Faith is being confident based upon the proofs and testimonies that give us assurance. Well, David had seen God vanquish Israel's enemies. He knew that it would happen when facing this giant as well. With one single blow to the head of Goliath, the Philistines who had entered this fertile field retreated in fear and the armies of Israel ensued as they sent the Philistines on the run. As they fled, the Bible says they passed by the Israelite fortress of Sha'arim and chasing them in battle as far as Gath and Ekron. David's victory is so significant, so stunning, that the Philistines don't merely retreat. They race all the way back home to the cities of Gath and Ekron. Now the text also mentions the city of Sha'arim, which means two gates. Archaeologists have identified this city as Kirbet Kiafa, which was a heavily fortified location overlooking the Valley of Elah. Kirbet Kiafa also had two gates, which have been excavated. As the story of David progresses, he finds himself facing yet another challenge in his life. This time, he is on the run, not out of fear or because of defeat, but out of necessity. King Saul, the very man who had made David a ruler over his armies, had become insanely jealous over David's rise to stardom and developed a, a burning fury to kill Israel's newfound hero. Refusing to retaliate, David was forced to flee and sadly, he became a fugitive in the land of his birth. First, David took refuge at the Philistine city known as Gath, 
where he frightened away King Achish by playing the part of a madman. The remains of this Philistine city are still in existence today and are but another example of the Bible's accuracy in regard to pinpointing cities and locations for various events and places mentioned in the Bible. Just imagine David coming to this place and acting as though he was mentally imbalanced and unstable, scratching out some type of marks on the city gates. Imagine also how degraded he must have felt to be reduced to such humiliation after having been a well-respected military commander. After leaving Gath, David began living in a cave in the Shephelah near Adulam. Adulam is just south of where David slew Goliath in the Valley of Elah, and in this area there are several good hiding places for a traveler to take refuge. Was it a cave like this to which David fled? Could it be that David was thinking of this place when he penned Psalm 142? Was he thinking about the humiliation he endured while playing the part of the madman at Gath? I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, You are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise your name. After his stay at Adulam, David found himself taking refuge in the strongholds and hiding places of the Judean wilderness. Largely uninhabited and barren, this territory is wedged between the hill country of Judah and the lifeless waters of the Dead Sea. Some 50 miles long and 10 miles wide, this area of Palestine is characterized by a steep descent of rolling hills that moves eastward out of the hill country to the Dead Sea. The steep descent means that the further one travels downward, the less rain they will encounter, and a traveler would soon then find him or herself traversing through a barren and precipitation-free environment. When rain does occur, it quickly runs off the impermeable rock and marl surface and down to the Dead Sea. The erosion that has occurred from the rapid runoff of the rain has left behind rounded barren hills with dramatic scarps and deep canyons and cliffs. While little vegetation exists, the wilderness nevertheless has a redeeming value in that it is often considered a place of refuge. The Judean wilderness was uh, a vast and, and stark area that was treacherous in many respects. It was known as an area of refuge because it had so many caves and so many areas where someone could hide uh, but it was also a place where uh, water was essential. Uh, and so you see David in the Judean wilderness uh, seeking after water. Um, you, you see it as a place of, of death, but you also see it as, as a place of refuge. The Hebrew word for stronghold is mitzad, and it means something like high mountaintop or fortress or even fortress castle. And it was in places like this that David would have come for security and for peace and for protection. One of David's strongholds is believed to have been here at Masada in this enormous escarpment. This impressive natural land feature would have been an ideal place for a small band of men to hide or even defend themselves against a larger army. Masada is a mountain plateau right on the banks of the Dead Sea that rises several hundred feet above the Dead Sea. It's very believable that David may have taken refuge on the the plateau that we now call Masada. The only means of accessing this stronghold was on the small, steep, and narrow path that snaked its way up the southern side of the enormous crag. The inhabitants above would have had a distinct advantage against a larger army of men who would have had to ascend the hill in a single file line amidst the arrows and boulders being hurled at them from above. Was it here that David was inspired to write Psalm 18? and in particular, these verses. The Lord is my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Wherever David may have taken refuge, whether in this stronghold, or in some other place in this region, you can be assured that through David's hardships, he was learning more about God and how to depend upon him. At Masada, God had become a refuge for David. 
It wasn't just at Masada that David's faith was being refined, but also right here at the springs of Engedi. In 1 Samuel chapter 23, we read that David came here in his flight from Saul, hiding in a cave somewhere near this area. In the middle of the desert, there is an oasis of beauty and refreshment, a sort of respite from the arid and harsh climate of the Judean wilderness. In Gedi means spring of the goats, and even today goats can be found stopping here to obtain an essential drink of water. Located some 20 miles due south of Qumran and some 11 miles north of Masada, in Gedi must have been a spectacular and invigorating sight for a weary traveler especially for someone like David who was fleeing for his life. I'm sure that Engedi, with its beautiful cascading waterfalls plummeting from the jagged cliffs of the desert, must have felt like paradise on earth and a great place to take refuge from an ensuing enemy. David and his men would have come to these waters to collect every drop of water that they could carry and gather whatever food they could find in this area as they made their trek up to Masada some 12 miles away to find refuge in the stronghold there. They would have also spent time in this area here, maybe dwelling in the caves in the stronghold of Engedi, having a resource of water and food to eat. As we examine the beautiful waterfalls of Engedi, it's easy to understand how David could have been thinking about this life-giving source when he penned Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Your loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise you. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. In several Psalms, we see David's references, his imagery, drawn from the wilderness of Judah concerning key moments of his own life. For example, in Psalm 18, David says God is a rock, a fortress, a deliverer. In Psalm 23, David uses pastoral imagery to describe God's care. Psalm 63 refers to God as a source of moisture and nourishment in a dry and thirsty land. And it's also possible that Psalm 142 draws upon the imagery of the caves at the wilderness border to highlight the fact that God himself is a place of refuge in times of peril. Could it be that David had this place in mind when he penned Psalm 104? He makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The birds of the sky nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. The high mountains belong to the wild goats. The crags are a refuge for the hyrax. A hyrax is a mountain badger, and even today they can be seen among the rocks and the hills of this area. It's a beautiful reminder that if these lowly badgers could find refuge in this barren land, then most certainly God's anointed, the soon-to-be king of Israel, could also be afforded protection by the one who made the rocks and the hills where the hyrax found refuge. As David was growing and developing as a youth, he was confronted with some challenging and frightening situations in his life. Having to face a lion and a bear wasn't an easy task, but it was during those harrowing experiences that David came to know more about the power of God through those harrowing events, God was preparing him to face a giant challenge later on in his life, one that would threaten not only his own life, but also the nation of Israel. As David grew older, he found himself facing other challenges, but this time they came from someone he had served and respected. Because of the bitterness and jealousy of Saul, David found himself traversing the vastly different and diverse terrain of Judah living under some very difficult situations and conditions in a very harsh and inhospitable environment. However, because of that experience, David learned dependency upon God, and in the process, his faith was being refined and his life was being molded to one day 
become a great king over Israel. Today we can likewise, through both personal triumph and hardship, have our own faith refined. Defeating our fears can embolden us for even greater battles, but also in the midst of some debilitating disease, some trial, some relationship problem, or in the midst of some great calamity, we likewise can find strength and learn to depend upon God. It's when we are put flat on our back that we then begin to look upward to the heavens. Yeah, I mean, suffering is a part of the human condition. And, you know, suffering is something that everyone experiences, no matter how great, strong, wealthy, no matter where you come from. And if we have faith, like David had faith, uh, suffering can refine us. It can define us and make us stronger. Uh, scripture tells us that we're tried by fire, and that's in essence what suffering is about, is by making us stronger, sharper, and I think when you think of David and the suffering that he went through, I think of how he allowed suffering to really draw him closer to God, uh, and we should too. Uh, suffering can draw us closer to God if we have faith in Him and realize that that's part of what draws us to Him and makes us more dependent upon Him uh, as a follower of God. Sometimes the circumstances that work for us occur while walking through the wilderness of pain. It can bring us to a place of emotional or spiritual poverty and can thereby teach us to rely upon God to provide for us something that we could not provide on our own. Sometimes, by traversing the mountains of despair, we develop strength. And sometimes, in the mountains of isolation, we find time and quietness to reflect upon the security of God. This is what happened to David in the land of Judah it was for him a training and proving ground of faith. In the darkness of a cave and in the wilderness of despair, David not only grew stronger, but also introduced the world to the greatest poetry ever composed. His time of pain brought us some powerful and vivid imagery for helping us in our own times of wandering through a wilderness of despair. Imagery that can still be seen today through the vistas and the environs of Judah, imagery that he used in describing the nature and greatness of God, imagery that can help someone like you and me to better understand the glory and the greatness of God. Judah was David's testing ground of faith. What testing ground of faith are you now wandering in? What hardship or temptation are you facing? My prayer is that you will put your faith in God. See Him as your Masada, your hiding place, and your strength. And always remember that we will sometimes experience the great mountaintops of joy, but at other times walk through a valley of despair. In those times of despair, remember the life of David, the land of Judah, and the God who made heaven and earth. canyon and I am a crevice. You are the heavens and I am a star. You are the thunder and Walking through the ancient tribal territory of Judah was really for me walking through the ancient past. I know that Israel today is a very modern country. They're a leader in nanotechnology. They're very advanced. They're a modern state. But while a lot has changed there over the last several thousand years, there's a lot there that still remains unchanged. For example, the basic geologic formations, the, the climate, the topography are all relatively unchanged. Just as they were in Bible times, they exist today. And many of those ancient water sources that were there still remain. Many of the same kinds of fruits and vegetables are still grown there today just as they were in Bible times. And even some of the same structures and the agricultural remains are, are still in existence. So being there is sort of like looking through a window into the ancient past. When you visit the valleys that run from east to west between the ancient Philistine coastline and the mountains of the Judean hill country, it's really easy to picture in your mind's eye some of the great Bible stories associated with people like Samson, 
like David, Joshua, Jonathan, or King Sennacherib. And as you work your way then from there over to Bethlehem and down to Hebron, you can almost see what it would have been like for Abraham and Sarah to sojourn here or for Jesse and his wife to, to raise their family there. And then, as you make your way into the Judean wilderness, you get a real sense of what it must have been like for David in his flight from King Saul. And then when I think of getting to walk in the fields where David once walked, or where he watched over his sheep, or to look out over the valley where he faced off against Goliath, or even to appear uh, and look into the caves where he may have hidden from Saul, or to feel the coolness of the refreshing waters from the area where he himself had stopped. I consider myself to be so blessed and so enriched. I'll never look at the Bible and the life of King David in the same way again. It's changed me. And I believe that everyone who watches this documentary will be changed as well. Because in the end, our message isn't about just presenting the facts. It's also about encouraging others when they face their own personal Goliaths out on the battlefield of life.